Yes. Great. Um, thank you for Sylvia for the introduction. Um, um, today I'm going to talk about an ongoing project in my PhD thesis. And uh, this, is, this work is about a pairwise competitive network of bacterial communities. Um, to start with talk, I want to give you some uh, about the motivation of this uh, work. So as uh, Martina pointed out, um, the micro we are living in a very diverse microbial world and these microbes are virtually everywhere and they perform important functions um, in their habitats. For instance, they are important decomposers in the, in the ecosystems. They can also help uh, degrade the, the wastewater from the human uh, industrial processes. And, and of course, they also produce uh, fermented food that we like to eat like cheese or wine. And there has been a um, great interest in trying to uh, assemble synthetic microbial communities, um, which can perform the functions that cannot be easily performed by the single strand. For instance, if there's a hard to degrade uh, toxin or, or uh, like lignin, it's hard for a one strand to, to fully de degrade the, the complex, then it needs a full community to do it. So uh, we as a human want to apply that into like uh, use, the, the, the ability of a microbial communities to perform particular function. Um, but before a community can uh, do a function, it has to coexist first. So recent interest has been in uh, predicting the coexistence of a, of a species set or community from the pairwise uh, competition. So uh, for instance, Friedman and Gore, uh, they proposed the simple assembly rule. So basically they uh, competed a, a set of uh, eight bacterial isolates, bacterial species, and then they competed all the pairs and trios. And what they found is that um, a, a trio can coexist only when all of its pairs coexist. So for example, in this uh, trio of ABC, it will degenerate into a pair of AB because in a pairwise competition, A uh, all competes C. So in this case, ABC will degenerate into AB. Um, however, many of uh, works in such microbial community has have been with uh, species that uh, may not uh, coexist together in the community, or uh, the environment that uh, we use to culture and and uh, compete the species or measure the pairwise competition is not the same as the environment where the community was first assembled. So it has been hard to see how uh, these affect the neural structure that we observed. <laughs> On the other hand, a, a natural microbial community is usually highly diverse. So a soil of uh, a grain of soil could harbor more than a thousand uh, bacterial taxa. And the number of pairwise uh, combinations increase in quadratic. So it's really challenging to measure all the pairwise combinations if we, are, we try to disentangle the pairwise network from these kind of highly diverse natural communities. So if we are able to assemble a uh, microbial community that with um, a decent number of species that we can manipulate and measure in, in, the, in the lab, and in this community, the, the species survival is mostly de uh, determined by the competitive interactions. And in principle, uh, the network of their pairwise uh, com competition should tell us something about their coexistence. So what I'm arguing here is that um, in imagining a species pool, there could be many possible uh, network topology among uh, species. And during ecological assembly of a community, uh, those network that uh, fail to persist will be purged by the selective force imposed by the uh, community assembly. And the other, the rest of uh, the, the network that can persist or the, the network of coexisting community will be favored and, and they will be present in the final coexisting community. So um, to test this idea, um, I'm taking advantage of the uh, previous work in the Sanchez lab, um, which shows 
um, when we start from a very diverse species pool. So these species can be from uh, leaves, so from the soil, basically very diverse, uh, diverse sources of, uh, of bacteria. When we grow um, these species in a simple environment in the lab, so it's basically uh, has only sugar as the uh, only carbon source. Um, in the end of uh, 12 serial dilutions, so you can think about it as a, a periodic uh, seasonal environment. And in the end, um, many of these communities have converged to uh, a similar taxonomy composition. Um, so these communities not only have the same families, uh, at least they are in the, in the family level. Um, so these families not only have the same family composition, but they also have the similar uh, proportions. So here I'm showing you the relative abundance of uh, 13 um, representative communities that we have assembled in the glucose environment. And of course, this pattern has been observed also in like the other 96 uh, glucose communities and the similar pattern also appears in, in the other kind of nutrient environments. But what we, we can take advantage here is that we are able to isolate the strands uh, from these communities. So we know these communities uh, coexist by themselves and we can take apart the community and then isolate each strand. And these strand will allow us uh, to be in a good position to ask a, a question here, which is uh, do stable communities that show similar uh, taxonic composition, do they also show um, general network structure. So um, there have been uh, several ideas being put forward to what uh, network structure we should expect to see in a coexisting community. So the first one is what I just mentioned uh, from the simple assembly rule. So it's basically saying everybody should coexist with everybody in pairs. So, so that's, um, the trio can coexist or higher di uh, diversity community can coexist. And the other idea is that uh, intrinsic cycle should be expected. So even though the species would not coexist in a pair, they are able to um, coexist in a trio or higher, uh, higher diversity uh, communities. So to test these two ideas, um, I uh, doing experimentally measuring the, the pairwise interactions. So take one uh, pair from the, for instance, the least community has its four uh, strands and take one pair, for example, uh, we manipulated the initial frequencies of these pairs from 95%, 50-50 to 595. Then we grow these pairs in an environment which is exactly the same as the community was assembled because it's a very simple, it's just M9 glucose medium. So after also serial passage, in the end, we, um, we plated these uh, final cultures on the solid alcohol plates. And then because their morphology are different, we can count uh, the colonies and determine the final um, relative frequency. So we have the relative frequency in the beginning of the experiment and after their competition. So um, one example I'm showing is uh, I'm plotting the relative of frequency of the three different uh, initial ratios in the beginning and in the end. So if each species can invade the other from uh, rare, then we consider that this community, uh, sorry, this pair is in a stable coexistent relationship, then we draw a mutual link to connect these two species. On the other hand, um, if only one species can invade from rare and the other cannot, then this pair is in a competitive exclusion uh, relationship. Then we draw a uh, one direction arrows to connect the winner toward the loser. So we can repeat it for all the possible pairs from the 13 communities and all, only pairs within the community are, are measured. So uh, I think maybe before I jump into the result, I can take a pause here to make sure that uh, 
people are fully understood with the uh, with the method. So, yeah. Does anybody have questions? Yeah. And I can I can proceed. I guess. Okay. Cool. So uh, after we're done with this uh, experiment, uh, we can test the first hypothesis, which is a uh, everybody coexists with everybody. And this hypothesis will give us a, a very intuitive expectation, which is um, all the pairs should be coexistence. We shouldn't expect any exclusion uh, happening in the community. Because remember these communities uh, coexist by themselves. Um, here I'm showing you the pulled result of all the 186 pairs I have from the 13 uh, communities. So what we found is quite contrary. So the coexistence is rather a minority of the pairs because only less than 40% of the pairs are coexistence. But more than 60% uh, of the rest of land are mostly exclusion. So this uh, seems that the, the simple spring rule may not apply in our community or at least they may not fully explain why our community coexists. So to explain why um, there are very high, there is high uh, fraction of exclusion links, we turn to the second hypothesis, which is uh, intransitivity should be expected. And we can measure uh, intransitivity for a network or for one community by uh, this ratio of intransitive, intransitive uh, the number of intransitive triads over the number of uh, all triad, possible triads in a community and work. So um, I'm plotting one intransitive uh, motif, for example. So this mock community has uh, three, only three species. And um, because it only has one possible triad, so, and it's a tr intransitive triad. So uh, this network has an intransitivity equals to one. And for, the, for the all 13 communities I have, uh, it's also surprisingly that we don't see any of the intransitivity found in the network. So um, similar to the simple assembly rule, the intransitivity also cannot fully explain why our community coexists. So we have tested um, two hypotheses that have been put forward to explain why network, uh, why, why, why uh, network structure should be present in the coexisting community. Um, but they all fail to explain why they coexist. So can we have a uh, more comprehensive way to describe network structure? Maybe we are missing some uh, network structure that uh, is present, but we didn't measure. So we use a the idea of a network motif, which is basically a recurrent uh, sub-networks that's uh, frequently observed uh, in a large network. So this idea has been, um, the network motifs idea has been used in a, a large number of different kind of biological networks. So this isn't a new idea. So network motifs has been used to describe network functions, full webs or uh, transcriptional networks or neural networks. And depending on the network types, um, the number of uh, network motifs are different. And in our kind of uh, competitive network, there are seven of them. So including motif one and seven, which are, I just uh, mentioned before. And there are the other five types of uh, motifs that are in the intermediates between motif one and seven. I'll explain these motifs in more detail when I show the data, but here I will just uh, walk through how these motif uh, analysis works. So uh, basically we can compare the observed network uh, to the randomized network to determine whether the uh, observed motif is, uh, is most statistically significant. So here is a uh, mock community of uh, 10 species. And all the pairwise uh, interactions is either, pairwise competition is either uh, exclusion or coexistence. Then we can go through uh, each of the triads in this uh, network. For instance, the, the red 
I know it's hard to see, but the red uh, triad is a motif that has two coexistence and one exclusion. Then we count this motif one and we go to the next one and we repeat it for all uh, the triads and the match them to each of the seven motifs. Um, then we come up, we, we can come up with the, the observation for this uh, network. And in this case, uh, motif one is not observed and motif two is frequent, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Then we randomize the network uh, just by randomly swapping uh, the pairs by like we keep the number of uh, coexistence and exclusion the same, but we swap in the links. Then we get a randomized network. Then we repeat counting the motif for this randomized network and randomize the network again, and then count the motifs again, and again, and again, for a thousand times. Then we can have a distribution of the motif counts from um, these, random, these thousand randomized networks. Then what we are doing here is that we can compare um, the observation to the randomized network. So if the observed motif count, for instance, motif one, uh, is very low, uh, it's very rare. So if it falls within the uh, bottom 5% of the randomized network, and then it's considered that this motif is underrepresented. Whereas uh, motif three is very uh, frequently uh, observed. If it falls within the top 5% of the randomized network, then it's considered a overrepresented uh, motif. So, for this overrepresented motif, we uh, shade it by green, and for underrepresented uh, motifs, we shade it by red. So we can repeat it for all the motifs. And before I go to the next slides, uh, I would just want to emphasize that this is just one uh, network. So we can repeat it for all the uh, possible, all the 13 networks I have and count the motifs. So in the next slide, what I'm going to show is a pooled result of all 13 uh, networks and count the motifs from uh, the observation and also randomized networks. So um, the first result that we can we can uh, uh, see is that uh, the intransitive motifs are underrepresented. So motif one that uh, forms an intransitive loop. And this motif is never observed in our uh, network. So it's consistent with our previous results. And of course, it's also underrepresented compared to the randomized network, which expect that we should see some of the intensity. And motif four is an interesting motif that is kind of half uh, intensity because it has A bits B, B bits C, but AC coexists. And these motifs is also uh, very rare in our uh, networks. So just a number of uh, total numbers of, of motifs, we have 288. And among them, we have observed less, uh, fewer than five of these uh, network motifs. And the third also kind of intensity, but it has two coexistence. And these networks also underrepresented um, compared to random. And we see some of the motif seven, the, the simple assembly rule, and it's more enriched than expectation by random. Um, so it seems that at the, the pairs level, uh, the simple assembly rule does not apply, but here it seems that if we look at the network structure, then these motifs uh, is more frequent than we expect by random. So it seems that the simple assembly rules works to some extent to explain our coexistence, uh, the community's coexistence. But this isn't the only enriched motif. Um, so there is one the, question from the yeah. chat. If you take it now on this. So yes. the question: You said these results are pooled over thirteen networks. How reproducible yeah. are these observations/slash statistics across the examples? In other words, what are the error bars on the plot on slide eighteen? As in, how big are the error bars? Yes. Sorry for the uh, inaccuracy. So the first question. Um, we, so across all the communities, there are some are really small, for instance, just three uh, species. So for large communities, if all the pairs are coexistent, then there's no way to randomize the network. 
So, and in the large communities, uh, there are more ways to randomize the network. So yes, there's uh, uh, the sample, the sampling uh, has different like uh, effects depending on the, the community size. But in general, for those communities larger than um, five or six uh, species, we do see this same pattern in those large communities. And for the second question, so the the bar uh, in these plots means that the, the range of the top five to the bottom five percent. So if a obs yeah, observation, uh, yeah, I understood the I understood what the bar here means. I just meant to ask, what are the if you added error bars on this plot, which would be how reproducible they are across maybe your large network examples, how big would they be? Like in this, if, for example, in your motif seven, you know, yeah. it's observation is just slightly above that range. If I put error mm -hmm. bars on the red dots, yes, Martina is helping me there. Yeah, what are the error bars on the red dots? Um, I, I'm not sure if I can draw the arrow bar for the observation because it's just one count for the total. But this is a poor result. So there's so this is not the mean of the of the all uh, networks. It's, it's a total count of all communities. So I don't think there's a way to draw the arrow bar. But if it's a, the mean of the total communities, I think this pattern should be consistent with uh, at least among those large networks. I... Okay, thank you. We, we can maybe discuss later as well. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for the uh, question. Yeah. So um, for the other kind of uh, of uh, motifs, uh, motif two, three, and five, they are all uh, overrepresented. So these three motifs share uh, a same uh, commonness, which is they are all uh, hierarchical, which means that a we see the motif layer hierarchies. So motif two is. A, a pure transitive train, A, B, 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 C, and A, B, C. And what is three is that one species beats the other two and the other two coexist. And motif five, which is the A, B coexist together, but they each outcome beats the third species. So these three motifs are all transitive and they are all overrepresented uh, in, in, uh, in our communities. So um, I think from this part, um, I can, I, ha I think I have shown some data that support the idea that stable communities um, exhibit generic ne uh, competitive network and which has the features such as species boards from these communities tend to be exclusionary than coexistence, at least in our simple environment. And if you look at the motifs, then interesting motifs are underrepresented, whereas uh, the transitive motifs are overrepresented in the in coexisting communities. So um, with this data, we can ask a second question I think is uh, very informative, which is whether this network topology uh, a property of community assembly or is it more constrained and emergent from the uh, ecological inductions? So in the interest of time, I just want to highlight uh, the, the scar scarcity of the two interesting motifs. Um, so motif one is never observed and, and, as, and the motif four is also rare as well. And I think part of the um, explanation for these motif can be uh, attributed to uh, the species pool. So if we consider a species pool and we connect all the possible networks in a species pool, then we have this uh, global network, which uh, is determined by uh, ecological interactions. And ecological inactions affects the species survival, which shapes the structure in, of this global network. And somehow, uh, if this global uh, network has the motif distribution different from the expectation by random, and it's possible that uh, the intensity motifs are also rare in the species pool. So even though community assembly will maybe favor uh, intensity motifs, but they are so rare, so it's unlikely that um, the community assembly could favor um, the enrichment of these motifs. So to test this idea, one way is to go through all the species pools and then try to map out uh, the network in the species pool. And it has been so much work, so I resorted to use a modeling approach. 
And uh, I'm using this microbial consumer resource model, which is basically uh, uh, captures the, um, uh, how a microbes will behave. For instance, what re the resource competition among microbes and what nutrients that the micro will prefer and, uh, and the metabolism that each microbe has. And then metabolism will determine what uh, metabolic byproduct that the micro produces and release to the environment. So we could include the, cross, uh, the common cross-feeding features of the microbial community into the model. And with this model, we could uh, simul simulate a experimental scenario, which is uh, start from a diverse species pool and then culture all the monoculture. In the, in the environments that we provide with them. It's a sim simple environment with only sugar. And uh, these uh, bacteria, some of them will not be able to grow because it's a minimum media. And for those that are able to grow, we can take a sample of three and compete all the pairs, exactly the same as what I did for the experiments. Then we can match a, the, the network for these communities, sorry, for this uh, network of three. Then we can repeat it for uh, a thousand times to get uh, a sense of what the species pool network would look like. Because of course, is we cannot uh, map out all the pairwise combinations in the species pool if the pool is so large, but we could easily get the data that is more uh, rich than uh, the experiment can do. So um, what I'm showing only motif one and motif four for uh, clarity. And um, as a control, I also ran a top-down assembly, uh, which is how we assemble the communities tested in experiment. And this is just for a control. And it seems like the model can, could capture uh, the result of, uh, of those experiments quite well, because motif one is never observed, and motif four is also rare. And each dot here is a mean of the 10 communities that I tested. And I, repeated for 20 species pools. So there are 20 points here. So in these top-down ensemble communities, uh, motifs, the two intrinsic motifs are underrepresented, uh, especially like regarding their absolute motif counts, they are pretty rare. Um, and similarly, uh, the species pool also uh, lack, also lacks intrinsic motifs. So motif one is never observed, and motif four is also rare. And there's no significant difference between the species pool and the community in the motif four. And motif one is never observed. So um, these kind of uh, support the, the hypothesis that the intrinsic motifs is already rare in the species pool. And of course, we I, I haven't uh, exhaustively explored all the possible uh, model parameter choice of the model because uh, there will be too many of them. But by tuning some of the parameters, it seems that these uh, features is general uh, uh, and it's not contingent on the parameter choice. Uh, and this pattern appears as long as uh, the new trend competition is considered in the model. So uh, this supposed idea that ecological interactions, in particular, new trend comp uh, competition would limit the, the, appear, the occurrence of the intransitive motifs. So uh, this is my final slide. Um, so do stable communities uh, assemble in simple environments show generic network structure? The answer is yes. And the structure is generic, at least in the simple uh, communities that we considered. Uh, this is important because I think in the more complex uh, community with all the other like, ecological mechanisms in play, I would, be, I would expect that the structure will be different and will be less predictable. And uh, is the network topology of property of a community assembly or is it uh, emerging from ecological interactions? I think part of the answer uh, is yes and could be explained by uh, ecological interactions, at least for the intensitivity that we observe, the lack of intensitivity we observe, and this could be mediated by, by ecological interactions and in particular resource competition. Um, so with that, I would like to thank for ICTP for inviting me to give this talk, and I also like to thank for uh, thanks everyone in Ascension Lab, uh, especially George Bayek who helped me with like experiment, 
And uh, I also like to thank for the uh, the funding fellowship uh, from the Ministry of Education in Taiwan.